Welcome again to the Gospel of Luke, this beautiful of all books, written by the master historian, the Apostle Luke, and the well-beloved doctor, medical doctor, who was a companion of the Apostle Paul. Well, we come to chapter 4, and... uh, In verse 13, after the trials in the wilderness, Satan left Jesus for a time. He returns, Jesus returns in the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went, into the, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, I want to pause here. The custom of Jesus was to go into the synagogues. Well, the synagogues were the Jewish form of the church. And uh, so it's very important to understand that as Jesus went to the synagogues on the Sabbath day, we likewise should go to church every Sunday. And that's an important thing, because you see, we need help, we need comfort, we need the fellowship of others. And it's received when we're in the body of believers who are the church. And the only way to do so is to go to church. So may God grant that each and every one of you will go to the church of your choice and uh, be suckered there. Well, in verse 17, we find the book that was given to him now don't forget uh, the Bible in those days was just a collection of scrolls and one was given to him Isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it's written the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel that is from Isaiah 61 and verse 1 and uh to preach the gospel to the poor he has sent me to heal the broken hearted to preach deliverance to the captives the recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are bruised what a wonderful ministry Jesus had and he fulfilled it well then he says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord It's interesting for a moment to go back to Isaiah 61 and uh, see exactly uh, what Jesus was doing here Uh, in Isaiah 61 he's quoting from the first verse and then in verse 2 to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and then at a comma he stops and a day of vengeance of our God. So, there's 2,000 years between the gospel story of grace, gospel story of redemption, gospel story of salvation, gospel story of love, and the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is coming soon upon this earth. You can see it in various places. Huge earthquakes here, there, the Psalms, and so forth. Oh yes, the day of wrath is coming upon all nations. So we want to buy up the time that is left to us to receive Christ as our Savior. Well... We move on now. He closed the book, gave it again to the minister, sat down, and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. 
And he began to say unto them, This day is the scripture fulfilled in your ears. I mean, they were amazed. He is the one of whom it was written. Very clear indeed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus. And the result was that he announced it. And they looked and wondered that the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. They said, it's not this Joseph's son. Well, and he said unto them, you will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. But he said, verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. You know, that was one of the uh, truths that was brought out to in Ezekiel. God said to Ezekiel, if I sent you to another country, they would believe you. But having sent you to your own people, they will not. And that is why so often God sends us to other places, because in our homeland and in our own family, we would not be accepted. And so, uh, that is one of the things that we have to understand why God sends us to other places, because they accept, but they won't accept in our own household. Well, then he said, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years, six months. Great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elijah sent save unto Sarepta, the city of Sidon. And uh, then he quotes uh, the lepers in the time of Elisha. None of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. And this is one of the things that uh, we also have to take note of. We have to take note of these truths. You see that sometimes the healing of God is selective. Sometimes what he does, he does in one place and not in another. You know, some uh, ministers, they are sent to a certain place and they lay hands on the sick and the sick are healed. and It's a wonderful, miraculous time. But those same ministers seeking to go somewhere else find that they don't have the same results. No, this is a truth that we have to understand that God is selective. God is selective. Uh, for example, there's a, in the Word of God, you know, there's the pool of Bethsaida. Well, here are all the sick people around seeking healing. But the Lord only goes to one person. And that one person, he says, get up and walk. Well, what about all the others? No, he wasn't sent to them. And so it's very much an individual gospel, if I could say this. And that is why we have to find out from God what his calling is and what he desires us to do. We cannot look at somebody else and say, well, they're doing that, they're blessed, I'll do that. No. I've seen that too often in my life, where people look at others, they try to copy them, and then to their horror, they have all kinds of tragedies in their own life. And they say, well, I'm copying somebody else, but yes, and the Lord didn't tell you to do that. See? And don't forget here, these are the two major prophets. They're only sent to one individual each. Elijah sent to a widow in Sarepta. And Elisha, well, Naaman, the Syrian, comes to him. And we have to ask ourselves, 
Lord, I have to be guided by Thee. You know, in the realm of divine healing, it's divine. Sometimes He did indeed heal many. And we shall see that a bit later on. But other times, it was very significant that he was only sending a prophet to one person. And so, uh, we must indeed understand these things. Now, the result in the synagogue was they were all filled with fury. They rose up and thrust him out of the city, led him under the brow of the hill whereupon their city was built and Nazareth was built on a hill and there was a huge ravine or gorge down below and they were going to cast him down headlong but he passing through the midst of them went his way you see this time Jesus saved his life why? because it wasn't the time for him to die see his life was very ordered by uh, the Heavenly Father. And so, he had to die in Jerusalem at an appointed time, and this was neither Jerusalem, nor was it the appointed time for his death. And so, for that reason, you know, uh, he saved himself. And he came down to Capernaum, and taught them on the Sabbath days, and they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. That's the beautiful thing with Jesus. You see, there was an anointing on the word. Now, in the synagogue at that time, there was a man which had a spirit of an unclean devil, cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone, what have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Out thou come to destroy us? I know thee, who thou art, the Holy One of God. Well, you see, the demons knew who Jesus was. They knew he was a son of, a son of God. And at other times, other demons had called out when he was approaching them, and said, um, Art thou come to torment us? before the time and uh, they knew we're told by James that the devils believe but tremble they know that the wrath is to come they know that they are to be cast into the lake of fire well Jesus rebuked him saying Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him and hurt him not. And everybody else was amazed. They said, well, what a word is this? For with authority and power he commandeth the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the fame of him went out in every place of the country. Well, he comes out of the synagogue and he goes into the uh, house of Simon or Peter and Simon's wife's mother was taken with a great fever they besought him for her he stood over her rebuked the fever it left her and immediately she arose and ministered unto them well we have some interesting little truths there, don't we? Obviously, Peter was married. <laughs> now, in verse 40, Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with divers disease brought them unto him. He laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. Now, here is different. You know, he's been speaking before of the fact that Elijah was only sent to one widow, Elisha to one leper, but here he's healing them all. 
And so you see, it's very much the wisdom of God that uh, is determining who should be healed and who should not be. Everybody here was healed. He put his hands on everyone. And the devils came out of many crying out, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. For they knew that he was Christ. You see, there was no, uh, shall I say, problem with the devils. They knew who the Christ was. The problem was with the human beings. They didn't know who he was. And uh, when it was day, he departed, went into a desert. And uh, the people came to him and besought him to come back and teach. He said, no. He said, I must preach the kingdom of God unto other cities. In other words, others must have the opportunity of hearing the gospel, not those who have heard time and time again. And it's very interesting in the days in which we're living that, uh, shall I say, the source churches who send out missionaries and uh, who minister in many other countries, they themselves are smaller than the works that they produce. You know, because people have become hardened to the gospel. But we're praying that God will open people's hearts to realize that the times in which we're living, that there's going to be absolutely no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And that's the purpose we preach. We want you to receive him as your saviour. And in so doing, you know, know the care of the good shepherd. Well, in chapter 5, it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake, uh, Lake Genesaret, or the Lake of Galilee, same thing, and saw two ships standing by the lake. But the fishermen would go out to them, were washing their nets. He entered into one of the ships, which was Simon Peter's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. He sat down and taught the people out of the ship. And so uh, there we have the ship pulling out from the shore, the people on the shore, and the Lord teaching them. And uh, after he left speaking, he said to Peter, Launch out into the deep, let your nets down for a draught. And Peter said, Look, Master, all night we have toiled and taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, how important that is. You know, it seems as though we've had no fruit. It seems as though we've had no joy. It seems that we've had no success. But then we seek the Lord, and the Lord tells us to do something. And if we will do what the Lord says, irrespective of our experience before, we shall see success. And that's exactly what happened with uh, Peter. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. And they bakened unto their partners, which were in the other ship, they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. You know, it's an amazing miracle, isn't it? From barrenness to fullness well that's possible with Jesus all things are possible and if you have a situation in your life which is hopeless and it seems as though nothing is going to succeed come to Jesus ask him to speak to you and ask him what to do but you could well be in this position too well Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees and saying, you know, depart from me, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. You know, when the blessings of God come, 
Now we realize our own condition. They were just, you know, taken back with amazement at the huge amount of fish they had taken. And then uh, Jesus turns it round into the spiritual. He said, Fear not, thou shalt become catchers of men. Catchers of men. Thou shalt catch men. Oh, how wonderful that was. And they have brought their ships to the land, they forsook all, and followed him. You know, it's at the time of greatest blessing. Our heart is moved, and we surrender all to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass when he was in a certain city, a man full of jealousy, uh, leprosy, sorry, came and uh, said, If thou wilt, thou can make me whole. And he said, I will, be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. You know, I had a friend, and uh, he was a missionary from America to Africa. And uh, he was one of missionaries to those, uh, shall I say, countries which were very ignorant and hadn't had much knowledge of the gospel. Well, anyway, he came and started preaching. And he preached, you know, with God, all things are possible. And he preached on this very passage. A man full of leprosy, Jesus healed. And then as he was preaching, he heard a noise at the back of the... Uh, shall I say, tent. And he looked up. And to his horror, he saw some people leading a man full of leprosy. And uh, the people came to him and said, look, you've been telling us that God, you know, with God, all things are possible. Here's the sick man full of leprosy. Pray for him. And they actually took his hands and placed them on the head of this man with leprosy. Well, he couldn't do anything else but pray. And he prayed and he prayed and he prayed and suddenly there was a shout. And he opened his eyes demoriously. And to his amazement, he saw this man the leprosy had disappeared completely. Oh yes, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. Well, the reason for all this was this. In verse 17, the power of the Lord was present to heal them. If God has his times when he will do things, it's not for us to dictate to God, but it's to say, God, let your will be done. And there you are. Well, there's another situation. A man taken with a palsy. And... Uh, they sought means to bring him and lay him before Jesus. They could not. And so they had to take the roof off and lower him down so that he would be at the feet of Jesus. And uh, Jesus looked at him and said, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and Pharisees said, How can he say that? Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus, you know, understanding their thoughts, he said to them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say, Thy son sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk? You know, well, he then looks 
at the uh, man and says that, uh, that you might all know the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, Arise and take up thy couch and go into thine house. And so he's saying to everybody, Well, if you want proof that I have the power to forgive sins, see what's going to happen now. And he says to the man, rise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up that where he lay, departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. They glorified God, were filled with fear, and said, we have seen strange things today. Well, if you believe God, you'll see strange things. And I want to encourage you to walk with God, to live with God, and you'll see that he will take care of you. These many years, 60 years I've been in the ministry, the Lord has taken care of me. And I want to say he'll do just the same for you. As you embrace these gospel truths, ask Christ to come into your heart, baptize with water, baptize in the Holy Ghost, And you will find that he's a very faithful friend and that he's the same yesterday, today and forever. God bless you.